Hello, my name is Nathan Brummel, and I am Professor of Systematic Theology and New Testament at Divine Hope Reform Bible Seminary. It's so good to be able to communicate to you today via video, and today we're going to look at ancient church history. We're in a class in which we look at the ancient church and also the medieval church as well. And today we're in Lesson 10, where we deal with the life of St. Patrick, who is the great missionary to Ireland. I also have a live audience here so that I have some people I can be directly communicating to as I give this message to the video camera. Today we're going to talk about St. Patrick, the missionary to the Irish. We are now in the middle of the coronavirus uh, pandemic and I'm unable to be behind bars teaching in prison right now, so I thought it'd be a great idea to focus my energies on putting together some classroom videos. So welcome to the students of Divine Hope Reform Bible Seminary, but I also want to do a warm welcome to any other men who are also joining us as well. Today we're going to talk about the life of a very remarkable man who lived in the early church. Someone who's not always so famous in church history, although every single year we Americans celebrate, well, at least we join the Irish in celebrating Saint Patrick's Day. Now today, St. Patrick, who lived a long time ago in the 400s, he was born in 415 AD and died in about 493 AD. His main reputation in the United States is because he is the patron saint of the Irish. And because every March 17, we have a St. Patrick's Day celebration. And on St. Patrick's Day, there are these signs up or people wear t-shirts that say, on St. Patrick's Day, everyone is Irish. So apparently there's one day in the year, at least in which you are Irish. And what happens on St. Patrick's Day? Well, if you go into Chicago, you can see the Chicago River being dyed green. Yeah, it's quite something that a boat, boat puts all this green dye in the water. Other boats around watching this happen. People are crammed along the side of the river in Chicago and watching this event. And if you live in New York City or in places like Boston, there will be St. Patrick's Day parades. So the public comes out in hordes and you see lots of people dressed in green to celebrate St. Patrick's Day. Really, almost today, just to celebrate the fact that you are Irish. Or maybe an Irish Roman Catholic, although, of course, there are also many Irish Protestants, especially in Northern Ireland today. So today his reputation is mainly made by the fact that there's this annual St. Patrick's Day in the United States. <clears throat> now, in America this might mean that you and some of your buddies go to an Irish pub. And guess what you drink? Yes, of course, some Guinness beer made in Ireland, which probably is also colored green. Now, if no one knows anything else about St. Patrick or Ireland, they might say, well, they identify the leprechauns. Well, that's a whole different story. The story of, you know, the mythical stories of leprechauns and there being rainbows and pots of gold. That has nothing to do with our story here. There are other myths, though, surrounding St. Patrick, and one myth is that St. Patrick threw all the snakes out of Ireland. So later on, why were there no snakes to be found in Ireland? Well, because St. Patrick, apparently, somehow got rid of them. Now, whether that's good or not, I don't know. It's probably not good for keeping down the mice population and various insects. But that's something that has been put to uh, St. Patrick. Also, what do you see on St. Patrick's Day? You see, of course, the green shamrock. Yes, this kind of unique leaf that has three different parts to it or whatever, and three different parts of it are symbolic for the Irish of the Trinity. And supposedly St. Patrick used one of these shamrock leaves to illustrate to the Irish the fact that God is three in person and one in his essence. Now, our concern here in this lecture is not to talk about the St. Patrick's Day that we celebrate in America today. Our concern is with the historic St. Patrick. Why do we call him St. Patrick? Well, that's because the custom rose in the Middle Ages of referring to great Christians as saints. But remember, from a biblical perspective, a saint is simply any Christian who's called a holy one. 
who's set apart from the world, set apart to a life of holiness. And so you, as a Christian, you are a saint. But we've gotten to the custom of referring to Patrick as a saint. And it's true, he was set aside by God also to be a great groundbreaking missionary to the Irish. And anyhow, simply due to custom that we use that language today. We call him Patrick. Now, uh, and so the question I have for you is, did you kids know, and uh, did you men know, that God used a 5th century Irish, or Englishman actually, a 5th century Englishman, a man who lived in the 400s, to do outreach and to win the Irish to Jesus? Well, that man was St. Patrick. Now let's talk a little bit about his birth and childhood. St. Patrick was born in 415 AD, so if you think about this, when he was born, Augustine of Hippo is still alive, although he's getting to be an older man. It's just a few years before Rome will be sacked by the barbarians. Now, he will live a long life, apparently, all the way till 493, so he ends, lives almost to the end of the 5th century. He was a British missionary to Ireland, that's why he's famous. But he was born in England. He was born in England. Now, if you know your map of England, you know that there's England, and then to the north is Scotland. Wales is to the west. And he was born in the northern part of England, and kind of close to the frontiers. And he grew up in a Britain, or in an England, that no longer had dominant Roman power there. By this time, the Roman Empire, Roman Emperor is located in the eastern part of the empire. And so there's been a vacuum of political power in the West. The barbarians have had their way and they'll be having their way throughout the 400s in the West. So that's why we call the time period that begins by now as the beginning of the Dark Ages. It's a time of the barbarian invasions, a time in which all of society and societal institutions are falling apart. Now this boy grew up in a Christian family. So he had a Christian dad and mom who took him to church and he heard God's ministers preaching in the church in England. It's not that it was called the church in England back in those days, but simply that part of the, the universal church that had been established in England. So he grew up going to church. So he grew up with the Bible, he grew up with the Bible stories. But as a young boy, he didn't repent of his sins. He didn't turn from his sins. He didn't fully trust in Christ. He believed in God, I suppose. He believed the basic Bible stories, and yet it didn't have a saving effect in his life. And so he was, I guess we would say, someone who was sort of an outward confessor. He went to church, but he really didn't have a saving knowledge of Christ. That would come later. So he grew up in a time when things were rough. The Roman soldiers had had to, uh, the legionnaires as a rule, had had to abandon England. And so it was a time of invasion. In Western Europe, it's a time when libraries are being sacked and burned. It's a time when cultural institutions in the Western part of Europe are under siege. And it's a tough time. It's a time of assault, pillage, rape, murder. And, and so it's a very, very difficult time to live in. Now, we meet up with this young boy, Patrick when he was 16 years old. That's the next, really the first important thing we know about his life. Now, if you would have actually lived there and you would have said, hey, Patrick, come over here, he wouldn't even have paid attention because his name would have been Patricius, which happened, by the way, to be the name of Augustine's father as well. So his name was Patricius, and one day Patricius was walking along the shore of the ocean the English shore, the seashore, with his dad and mom. And as they're walking, they suddenly see, a little ways away, they see a bunch of ships off of the coast. And it turns out there were something like 50 boats. And he watched, and I'm sure the second that his dad and mom and he saw these boats, they were uh, very concerned and then probably terrified and probably knew right off the bat that these were raiders coming. Now, it turns out that the men in these boats were Irish, barbarian, Celtic soldiers. And yes, they were raiding the coast of England. And one thing they're trying to do is they're trying to capture men and women and children to sell as slaves. 
So his dad and mom and he watched these ships all come to the shore and saw the soldiers step, step out on the pebbles of the beach and they came unopposed. They got out of their kuraks, that's what you call their, their boats, their long boats, and they pulled them up on the shore and they began heading towards his village and they were absolutely unopposed. There was no organized um, way to try to stop them. At this time, um, there were no region, Roman legionnaires in town, for example, who could be there and who could try to resist them. And so they disembarked. They had gaudy helmets on, they had spears and they had swords and they jumped out of their longboats and ran into the town. And you can imagine the screaming and the crying going on. So these Irish Celtic soldiers pillaged the town. They killed men, they tried to capture women and children in order to take them back as slaves. And so they did that. They started the city, the town, the village on fire, burned it up, captured men and women, and brought them back into their boats. And guess who, yes, they also captured. Patricius, or our Patrick. So Patrick is now age 16. At age 16, suddenly he's torn away from his family, thrown into a longboat by these barbarians, and they take him back in their boats to Ireland. Now in those days, in England, there were many Christians. But in Ireland, the whole country, almost to a man, were barbarians and they worshipped um, the gods that the Druids taught them to worship. And so this boy, can you can imagine what it was like for him to be brought to a slave market, and in the slave market um, they would auction them off or sell off the slaves, and he was bought by a guy, and not a nice guy. The guy who bought him was a barbarian leader, a vicious, cruel guy. You know what he liked to do with his enemies? He would cut their heads off, and then he would prop their heads up on rods or on sticks and lead them on poles around his little, little fortress, the little fort. And so here Patrick is bought by a ruthless guy. And guess what his job is? You wouldn't believe it. His job is to take care of pigs. Yeah, think of the parable of the prodigal son and think of how that Prodigal, you know, when he loses all his money and he comes to nothing, guess what? The only job he can get is taking care of a man's swine. For a Jew that was working with unclean animals. Well, now Patrick's job is to take care of this guy's pigs, but that's not even the worst of it. This uh, barbarian chieftain says, you got to take care of the pigs, and you have to take care of them up over in the hills, away from everybody. So his job was to take care of these pigs, isolated from everywhere else, in the hills away from the fort, and where the people lived. So here you now have this kid who's 16 years old, you know, used to living in sweet fellowship and communion with his family and with other people. Now suddenly for months on end, he doesn't see another human soul. So it's the only time he sees anybody is when the uh, chieftain sends someone to get some more hogs to butcher or something like that, or he has to drive some hogs back into the village. But there he is left out there by himself. And his job is to provide for and to feed these pigs. And he wasn't provided for sufficiently either. So just like the prodigal son who starved and wished he could eat the food that he fed the pigs, Patrick, he didn't have enough to eat. So he's a 16-year-old boy, and he's practically starving. His only friends are swine. But God used this wretched situation to bring this young man to a saving knowledge of him. Isn't it interesting how this boy is away from his dad and mom, brothers and sisters, all of his loved ones, and guess who he's left with? The God of his fathers. So what he does in this tough situation is he cries out to God, and God hears him, and God saves him. And so this young boy becomes an amazing man of prayer. I mean, you know, can you imagine what it'd be like if you're suddenly stuck in, for example, solitary confinement? You know, I know men who have been in solitary confinement and haven't been able to talk to anyone else, and God has used that to give them a rich experience of prayer. He's the only one they have to talk to. And so it is with this young boy. The only person he has to talk to is his God. And so now God gives him saving faith. Later on, Patrick would tell us, he says, I would pray constantly during the daylight hour, 
He said, the love of God and the fear of him surrounded me more and more, and faith grew. And the spirit roused so that one day I would say as many as a hundred prayers, and at night only slightly less. So notice this. He has no one else to talk to, but he's talking to God. He says hundreds of times a day. And at night when he's laying in bed and it's dark outside, and he's sleeping outside probably, watching the pigs, he's talking to his creator. So God used his social isolation in order to draw him into intimate fellowship with him in prayer. So we have a young boy here who is suddenly living in very, very sweet communion with God, even though he is in a wretched situation. Well, a few years passed as a young boy, as a teenager, who was 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, he endured this slavery and had a wretched existence, except for he had, he had a God now who was uh, his Savior. In 437 AD, when Patrick was now 22 years old, after enduring slavery for a number of years, ever since he was 16, he escaped from his master. Now, the reason why he was able to do that was because he was out there all by himself. It's not like he had someone constantly watching over him, you know, to see whether he would escape or not. And what happened is that, you know, supposedly he heard a mysterious sound that told him that he should go back to his homeland. Now, I'm not sure what's all going on with this. Later on, he does say that the same voice told him, come and see, your ship is waiting for you. Now, I'm not one who believes in new special revelations, so I'm not sure exactly what was going on here. But anyhow, Patrick thought that whatever this was he thought he heard meant that he should try to run away from his master. And so what happens is that the boy who's now 22 years old flees from the hogs and takes off cross-country in Ireland and actually has to walk 200 miles until he arrives at a seashore town. Now when he arrives there, he found that there was a ship that was going to sail with some traders to mainland Europe. Some people think that they were going to try to sell probably some Irish wolfhounds in Europe. Apparently one thing that was exported from Ireland was Irish wolfhounds. But he got in the ship and on the ship this young man who's only 22, he must have been a Christian witness to these Irish sailors who are no doubt pagans. Now, why do I say that? Well, because they arrive three days later in France, and guess what happens? They arrive on the coast of France, and they think, okay, now we're going to get some food and resources. But all of the land in Gaul, you know, what is today France, was back in those days called Gaul, was, it was just devastated. All the area had been devastated around there by some barbarians. And so there was no food available. And so... What happened is that the Irish sailors began giving a hard time to our young Patrick. They said, what have you to say for yourself, Christian? The captain said, you boast that your God is powerful. We're starving to death and we may not survive to see another soul. Because there was so many people have been killed off and harvest is devastated. There was no food around. Well, apparently Patrick had been talking about how, you know, his God provided for him. Well, what happened is that the escapee responded in faith. He said, nothing is impossible to God. Turn to him and he will send us food for a journey. So he's referring to the fact that God's people can say, give us this day our daily bread. Well, as soon as Patrick said these words, suddenly some wild hogs came running right across the path where they're at. And so they were able to kill these hogs. And these pagan sailors suddenly had a whole new respect for Patrick. And, um, but they caught these pigs and they didn't worship God, however. They sacrificed some of these pigs to their Celtic idol gods. And then Patrick wouldn't eat the food that they sacrificed to the idols. So they didn't repent, but they had a whole new respect for Patrick. Now, we're not even sure what Patrick did while he was in France. When he was 22 or 22 years old, yes, he fled from his, his slave owner. But we don't meet him back up in England again until sometime in uh, his late 20s. So between the ages of 22 and 29, well, they're kind of like dark periods in his life. We don't even know what happened. Now, some people think that what happened is that he spent the whole time in Gaul, in France. And some people think that what he did while he was in Gaul is that he was able to uh, study 
at a place in France where he could have studied for the Christian ministry, but we don't know if that happened or not. Later, or not, later on, you know, he's, as a missionary, he's very humble, and he talks about how I'm, I'm quite ignorant and unlettered, he, he would confess. But some people think that he uh, went to a place on the island of Lorenz, which is in the southern part of Gaul, and that there he somehow was able to study for the ministry. But all, all we know about his life for sure is that he escaped from Ireland, and then in the, uh, his late 20s, he was somehow back again in England, back in his hometown. So he comes back to England in his late 20s. He had matured in his Christian faith throughout this time. But even after this period, we're not so sure what he does for a while. He's going to be about 45 before he's appointed to be a missionary. So what he does between you know, his late 20s and the time he's 45, we're not also sure. But we do know that he experienced a dream one time, and he took that dream to be telling him that he should be engaged in missions to, of all people, the people who had enslaved him. Now, this is a striking thing about the Christian faith, right? Jesus talked about how we should bless those who curse us, do good to those who mistreat us. Here we have a young English boy, and he's kidnapped and enslaved by Irish barbarians, and guess what he wants to do? He wants to go back and bring the gospel of salvation to the Irish barbarians. You know, you know it's a, that's, a, that's a good way of getting yourself enslaved again, isn't it? And yes, later on, as a missionary, that's something he does worry about at times. Are they going to grab me and enslave me again or kill me? But um, he had a dream that reminds one of uh, how the Apostle Paul, remember, on his second missionary journey, the Apostle Paul was making his way through Asia Minor, through modern-day Turkey, and he came to Troas, and there God gave him a vision. God actually led Paul about where to go next in his mission and journeys. And in a dream and a vision, he saw a man dressed as a Macedonian, and the guy said, come over and help us. And that's how God let Paul know that he wanted him to cross the Aegean Sea and for the first time bring the gospel to the continent of Europe, to the northern part of Greece. Well, Patrick... He had a dream one night, and he dreamed of a guy named Victor Arenas, or Victor Riccius. And in his dream, he, he thought that Victor Riccius was an Irishman. And then in his dream, he also heard the voice of another man, or a number of men, saying along with this guy, We appeal to you, holy servant boy, to come and walk among us. Now, what happens is that Patrick interprets this to be something like a Macedonian call. He interprets to be saying that what he should do is he should go to Ireland and he should preach the gospel of Christ. And so he approaches the English church. Now, he was the perfect guy, of course, for this mission because he had used, learned the Celtic language. Over the years he had spent there, he had learned how to speak the local language. So, of course, that would help him as a missionary. Now, the church had at least one time before tried to engage in mission work in Ireland. That was in 431 that uh, the church, with the support of Pope Celestine I, had sent a guy named Palladius to be the first missionary to Ireland. Now, we're not sure what happened there. The year in which that guy went was the same year in which Patrick had been captured and enslaved. But we know nothing more about what happened to this Palladius. Some people think he was martyred, but what is certain is that he didn't play any role in establishing a church in Ireland. So any attempts at Christian mission up until this point had crashed and burned. Now, the place where Patrick would soon arrive was very pagan. Celtic paganism was dominant. And as a missionary, Patrick would write this. He said, I dwell among Gentiles in the midst of pagan barbarians, worshipers of idols, and of unclean things. In 460 or 461, the English church commissioned Patrick, who is now 45 years old. So notice a good number of years have passed. He's had a time to mature. And they commissioned him to be a missionary bishop to Ireland. Now, Patrick later on would talk and write about his weaknesses and his inadequate preparation for the ministry. In his Confession, which is a book that he wrote to defend himself 
but which was sort of like a spiritual memoir, he humbly talks about his shortcomings as a preacher. He said, I still blush and fear more than anything to have my lack of learning brought into the open. And he talked about how he was intimidated by well-educated people. He says, for I'm unable to explain my mind to learned people. But he was struck by the fact that how, you know, even though he had a lot of weaknesses, God had powerfully worked through him. He says, you know, he said, he praised God who stirred me up a fool from the midst of those who are considered wise and learned in the practice of the law, as well as persuasive in their speech and in every other way, and ahead of these others inspired me who is so despised by the world. At times, he even wondered whether he was qualified to be a minister. And unfortunately, other people also questioned whether he should be a missionary and a bishop. Because while he was over there ministering, someone began spreading rumors about some youthful indiscretion he had done. We're not told what this foolish thing was. So he had committed some sin, some rash sin when he was a youth. And what happened is that people began to argue that that's why he should be a missionary. And so they even sent a delegation over to Ireland to check up on him and to see how his mission was doing. And in response to that, Patrick took up his pen and wrote his confession, of course, modeled after Augustine's confession, which it was a spiritual memoirs where he told the story of what had happened to him and where he attempted to vindicate himself. Now, one thing I like about all this is that we see that God uses some very imperfect, weak men. God doesn't use to accomplish his purposes people who are only highly educated, in the most learned schools in a country, or people even have the greatest gifts of writing, but God, through his spirit and by his might, can use very imperfect and weak people to accomplish great things, as we shall see. But before we go any further, I'd like to ask if there are any questions that uh, any of you uh, students of the room here might have. Do you have any students? Any, any questions about anything we've been talking about? No questions? Um, how did he, um, how did St. Patrick's Day become the uh, kind of worldly event it is now? So the question is, when did St. Patrick's Day become the event it was? Well, it goes all the way back to the 700s, all, all the way back in the 700s already. We have a date in which March 17, yes, and some date way back then is called the Feast of St. Patrick's Day. Now that followed a custom in the early church that if you would have a person they designated a saint, they would get a day of the year that would be their saint day. And on that day, for example, people would go to church and listen to messages about that person's life. And unfortunately, people would pray to them as well. But that's the history of it. And so when, the, when many Irish immigrants came to the United States, they brought that custom of a St. Patrick's Day along with them. And it's become, of course, more secularized today compared to what it would have been in the past. Well, now, who are these people, then, to whom Patrick needs to bring the gospel? Well, the answer is that they're Celtic tribes. But who are the Celts? Now, today, you, you might even know that Celtic music is, like, really popular. What is Celtic music? Well, it's Irish music, folk music. Well, the Irish, you see, were Celts. They were descended from Celtic tribes that had originally lived in Eastern Europe, though, a thousand, in a thousand BC. So think about this. In a thousand BC, in Eastern Europe, there were these Celtic barbarian tribes. Well, what happened is that some of those barbarian tribes made their way into Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey, and they conquered a whole province among the Greek speaking people there, and the province became called. Galatia. Well, of course, Christians, we know that Paul wrote a letter to the Galatians. Yes, it's written to people who live in that province, you see, who had been settled by some of these early Celts. Well, the Celts were divided up all to different tribes. Sometimes they were called Galatians. Other times, when they settled in western France, they were called Gauls. Now, both the Greeks and the Romans considered them barbarians. Now, in 390 BC, a Celtic tribe in the western part of Europe actually was able to sack Rome. But much later, in 50 BC, Julius Caesar was able to defeat the Gauls in the Gallic Wars. In fact, he would write about his victories in the Gallic Wars. But the result of that battle was that the defeated Gauls fled mainland Europe and they went 
to England and to Ireland significantly. And so that explains the, or the existence of these Celtic tribes in Ireland. 